What's going on everyone? Today I'm here with Mr. Abraham Bolton. Now he was the very first Secret Service agent within the black community. So Mr. Bolton, how you doing? Good. I'm doing fine, sir. How are you? I'm doing fine. So Mr. Bolton, could you tell us how did you even get involved to even be chosen to be a part of the Secret Service? Well, I had a long history of police work before I went into the Secret Service. I had been the Illinois State Policeman. I'd also been the first African American Pinkerton National Detective uh, in 1957 in St. Louis, Missouri. So I had had a pretty long history in uh, police work. Okay, so you was a career police officer, and obviously, when well, you became a police chief, or. No, the, how this happened is that uh, I went to uh, Lincoln University, graduated with a degree in music composition, but all of my life I had wanted to do something in law enforcement or in some occupation or another in order to help the people. I thought that I could find out a solution to help the people in the situation that we were in. Having grown up in East St. Louis, Illinois, which was like living in uh, Mississippi or somewhere. It was a small uh, town in in Illinois, in southern Illinois, prejudiced town, segregated, and uh, the, this was a challenge to me. And in my youth, I always wanted to try to figure out a way uh, to uh, develop some plan or receive some type of knowledge in order to combat the situation that I found our people in. So being a police officer, excuse me, being a police officer during a time of segregation, how did they put you more to uh, patrol the black community, or you just patrolled everybody? Yes, well, on the state police, I I, I uh, patrolled everybody, and and that was in Peoria, Illinois, between 1957 and 1960. Uh, that uh, I patrolled everybody on the state highway. Uh, but uh, in Pinkerton, I investigated primarily African American subjects who uh, insurance investigation, uh, divorce cases like that, surveillance uh, techniques. And in the United States Secret Service, I investigated uh, uh, mostly African Americans who violate the federal law. So, as a Secret so Service agent, um, the, what's the process, if you can discuss it, what is the process like, how do you actually get on Secret Service? Do, are they ask you or is it a job that you could possibly, you know, say, hey, I want to be a part of this? How does that normally work? Because they don't really tell you that you know, process. A person can file an application to get into the United Secret Service now over the internet, as a matter of fact. Uh, he'll have to take a Secret Service test. He'll also have to take a Civil Service test, a routine civil service test that's given now under the uh, Homeland Security. And he would have to pass both tests in order to qualify for the Secret Service. Now, they demand at the present time a degree in, in some subject, literal arts, uh, it can be any degree, with experience. You have to have experience uh, with a degree. Now, it wasn't that way when I went into the Secret Service. However, most of the agents did have uh, some type of college degree. I had, as I told you before, a bachelor's in, uh, in uh, music uh, composition from Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri. But uh, instead of going into the teaching field, I had this, uh, uh, you might say, this feeling, this, this, this longing to get to the bottom of the situation so far as the criminality was occurring in our neighborhood. And I thought that it would possibly, uh, uh, I could learn some knowledge, learn something about it by becoming a, a policeman. And that, that's the reason I pursued that area of uh, job. So you served under <laughs> President Kennedy, correct? I served under President Eisenhower and President Kennedy. Okay, so when you served under President yes, Ken Kennedy, um, yes, and yes. did you ever get to speak to him personally? 
the Secret Service on October the 30th of 1960. Now, President uh, Kennedy was a senator at that time. He was running for president against Richard Nixon. Uh, of course, we know that, that Kennedy won that battle between he and, uh, he and Nixon. Now, I was sworn in as a Secret Service agent after passing the Civil Service examination in Springfield, Illinois. I was sworn in here in Chicago in the Chicago district, which is the second district of the United States Secret Service. Now, being a, a new agent and being assigned to Chicago, the main objective of the United States Secret Service is to combat counterfeiting and check forgery, uh, computer scams, and things like that. But the main objective is given to the, by the Constitution of the United States, the main objective of the Secret Service is the protection of the President of the United States and the First Family. And, and that's, uh, that's the main objective of the United States Secret Service. And foreign diplomats who may visit the United States, that's under the jurisdiction of the United States Secret Service. Up until I was sworn in, uh, there were no African American Secret Service agents as of October 30th of 1960. So I became actually the first African American uh, to become a United States Secret Service agent. Now, being a, a new agent stationed here in Chicago, I was not very well received. The 60s was a rough time for our people. That we, the, we, the civil rights activity was at its height. There were fire bombings in our schools, churches were being bombed. Uh, African Americans were being lynched in the Deep South, and uh, it was just a horrible time of existence for our people during this particular time. The uh, and this was uh, international, you might say, is that there were being uh, rise ups in Africa, there were being rise ups all across the United States, come from California, from coast to coast. It was just a hell of a time during the early 1960s. Now, Kennedy, after he won the presidency, he was coming to Chicago to pay a visit at a convention to thank Mayor Daley and his political associate for the uh, turnout that he received here in Chicago, Illinois. Now, normally when the president comes to any town, the Secret Service agents who are stationed in that town they're the ones who augment the forces who normally travel with the president. The president usually travels with about 45 bodyguards who are in his close uh, proximity, and then there it's beefed up by members from the United States uh, Army, the Air Force, and some other uh, uh, military organizations. And uh, so the president was coming to Chicago on April the 28th, of 1961. I was a new agent having been appointed by President Eisenhower. Now, normally, as I said, the Secret Service agents who dress in plain clothes who are in the near proximity of the President usually are close to him in some association, standing near him in a banquet hall or something like that. And but when the president was coming to Chicago, by me being a, a so-called Negro agent, they replaced my position, which was in the banquet hall, with a, a Chicago policeman. They put a uniformed Chicago policeman close to the president and put me downstairs in the lower level of the McCormick place in his stead in front of a washroom. Well, as Iron and Faith would have it, when the president arrived at McCormick Place to give his speech at 8.30 on April the 28th of 1961, the first thing he wanted to do was use the washroom, and there I stand. They had replaced me and put me there as a sort of a throw me out of the way so that I wouldn't, would not be seen by the president of these uh, uh, rich people who were attending the affair, some of them had donated, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to be at, at that convention. Mm -hmm. Well, I was put in a place where 
the president, as I said, the first thing he wanted to do was use the washroom, and there I stood. And as he came down the, the uh, steps leading to the washroom, he stopped directly in front of me. And uh, he smiled. And he asked me, he said, are you a Secret Service agent or are you one of Mary Daly's finest? I said, I'm a Secret Service agent, Mr. President. And the president uh, looked around and one of the other agents told him, said, that's Agent Bolden. He's stationed here in Chicago. Now, had I not been standing there, I would not have met the president. However, this is what happened. The president looked at me and said, Mr. Bolden, he says, has there ever been a Negro assigned to the White House detail in Washington, D.C.? I said, not to my knowledge, Mr. President. And he looked me in the eye and he smiled. He said, would you like to be the first? I said, yes, sir, Mr. President. He said, I'll be looking forward to seeing you in Washington, D.C. And I just thought that that was terrific. Now, you see how things turned out. Now, they thought that they were hiding me in a place that was out of sight, away from everybody else, from the president, from the convention hall. And the president, found we found each other downstairs in the basement standing in front of a watch room. And from that, I became the first African-American uh, Secret Service agent to be appointed to the president on the White House detail in Washington, D.C. And on June the 6th of 1961, I made that long walk, the same one that President Obama made his first day in the White House through those two big doors and walked into the history, which was initiated by President John F. Kennedy. Wow, that's, that's something that, that, you know, we don't... We don't here or, or you know you really you a person that should be taught about you know within black history and we don't even know much you know about you at all now let me ask you a question um when president kennedy was assassinated uh, you know how did the secret service you know really you know took that well when i was on a presidential detail i traveled with the president to annisport massachusetts to his home where, where they, uh, he introduced me to members of his family. We had a discussion with uh, Bobby Kennedy. I met Jack and Kennedy and the little children and things like that. Many of them are adults now. I was treated very well by the president. But the Secret Service agents didn't like me breaking up that good old white boys club that they had going. And they were doing... Uh, things that were detrimental to the protection of the President of the United States. So I began to complain about it. They were drinking on duty and uh, they were hustling women in and out of the federal cause and they were, they were the, the conduct were just uh, atrocious. They were reporting for work drunk and I thought that this was really something that was uh, 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 a condition that should not exist in the close proximity of the president. However, I later discovered that there were a few of the agents who were so violently against the president's stand on civil rights issues. These were southern agents that uh, they said that they would refuse to do their duty in protecting the president if an assassination attempt would be made. Now, I thought this was so serious that uh, when I went back to Washington, D.C. on uh, July, the, that was on July the 6th of 1961, I went straight into the chief's office of the United States Secret Service and reported to the chief that I thought that President Kennedy's life was in their danger and the fact that they were uh, uh, calling him by the names such as nigger lovers and picking lovers and, and different things and that he was ruining the country by standing up for integration and there were going to be little black boys and having little half white babies and things. They, it, it was just the South all over again. But it was more serious because this was relating to the President of the United States. Now, I had my supervisor to show you how serious this thing was. We were in Hyannisport, Massachusetts on July the 3rd of 1961, that was the day before July the 4th, and the president had just came in from a, a yacht ride, and uh, the president and I had a conversation. 
the assistant special agent in charge of the White House detail on my ship uh, saw the president and I talking and, uh, and with uh, Bobby Kennedy, who was a United States Attorney General. He took a front to it. He didn't like it at all, like I could see. And he was from uh, one of these small towns in Mississippi. So when we got back to the room where we were, where we were all living, we had a complex where the Secret Service agents were living. Uh, he was sitting around drinking beer. I think it was on his third or fourth beer. And he called me, he said, Bolden. I said, yeah, Harvey Henderson was his agent's name. He was the acting special agent in charge of my ship. He says, I want to tell you something and don't you ever forget it. He says, you're a nigger. You were born a nigger. You're going to die a nigger. You'll never be anything else but a nigger. So act like one. That's what my supervisor told me. Look me straight in the eye. And that's what he told me. And wow. so I reported that also to the chief of the United States Secret Service, who was U.E. Bowden. At that time, I also complained that the chief of the special agents who were assigned to the White House had lost control of his agents, and they were drinking and carrying on cabaret. They were drunk on duty. They were walking around uh, doing different things when they should be on duty. They were off in town somewhere uh, uh, cabaret. Now, the chief of the Secret Service to whom I made my initial complaint, he retired in August of 1961, and guess who took his place? the chief of the Secret Service detail for the president who I complained about was not doing his job. Oh. So now he became the chief of the whole United States Secret Service. So he had access to all of the information that I had told the chief before him. So you could see that I wasn't on good terms then with the whole uh, United States Secret Service. But I didn't give up on that because I thought it was so important that the President of the United States should have the, the best protection that he could have. In the first place, President Kennedy was a very wise man. He was a very fair-minded man. He was a sincere man. And uh, he wanted to make an equal playing field for all of the people in the United States, no matter what their gender, color, race, or whatever it was, I saw it in his eyes because his treatment of me when I was on the White House detail, uh, how he treated me let me know the sincerity upon which he looked at things, the question that he asked me, and we had discussions about the civil rights movement and things like that. And he was very interested in, and it was heartfelt, he had a compassion for the suffering of our people and he wanted to do everything that he could to alleviate some of the suffering because the president having come from a very wealthy family they still had a lot of problems i mean they, they had uh, uh had to endure many many tragedies and that gave him a special compassion and empathy for the suffering of other people i believe that i saw it in his eyes and not only that it was my responsibility as an agent of the United States government and as a Secret Service agent to see that the president received the best protection that was possible given to his office of the presidents of the United States. Now, it was evident as I uh, became familiar with the activities of the agents surrounding the president that they had lost his focus. They were looking as if they were protecting President Kennedy rather than the constitutional office of the United States, the presidency of the United States, which is bigger than one man. The, uh, the president is just a hole in the office of the presidency. So when they, uh, when I understood from some of them, their discussions that I overheard saying that they would not protect the president of the United States, then what they were actually saying that they would let someone overthrow the presidency of the United States, which is an office on our Constitution of the United States, which means we would have been in a tyranny situation. 
our government would uh, collapse because of a tyranny. Now, I complained throughout 1961, 62, and 63. I asked to be transferred back to Chicago, Illinois, which I was transferred back to Chicago, Illinois. But I kept up my complaints and kept up my complaints. Now on November the 22nd, 1963, at noon in Dallas, Texas, it happened. The president was assassinated. He was indeed assassinated. After the president was assassinated, I witnessed as an agent of the United States Secret Service a big cover-up that was going on between the FBI and the United States Secret Service to mislead the American people as to who was responsible for the assassination of President Kennedy. They were denying information that they had, that we had, and then investigated. They were changing files. They were documenting, uh, 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 eradicating files, destroying evidence of others who were involved in a uh, conspiracy to kill the president of the United States. Now, I thought it was my duty to bring that, that to the attention of the Warren Commission who Johnson had President Johnson, who took over after Kennedy was assassinated. I wanted to bring that to the attention, the fact that there were being uh, things that were covered up that would be very instrumental in determining who assassinated President Kennedy. I wanted to give the Warren Commission the information that I had that was not going to the Warren Commission, that was not being received by them, because the Secret Service and a few other agencies wanted to keep a cap on it, had to keep a low profile on the information and investigations that we had conducted. So when I went to Washington, D.C. on May the 17th of 1964, I was immediately brought back after trying to contact J. Lee Rankin, who was one of the attorneys for the Warren Commission. I tried to contact him to get a, get a chance to make my testimony before the Warren Commission and reveal to them some of the things that were being hidden and covered up by the United States Secret Service. So they brought me back to Chicago. They put two criminals together. They got a warrant for my arrest and charged me with soliciting a bribe based upon testimony of two criminals whom I had arrested. One I had arrested three times for counterfeiting money. He had nothing to lose. They put me on trial here in Chicago for soliciting a bribe. Now these were set up trials. They were nothing but mock trials. Uh, at the end of the test, I had two trials as a matter of fact. One trial began on, on uh, July the 6th and ended on July the 12th. At the end of the testimony during the trial, the judge called the jury out of the jury room where, while they were deliberating and told the jury point blank, in my opinion, a Bolden is guilty of count one, two, and three of the indictment. Now go back into the jury room and deliberate with the information I just gave you. He told them to go back in and find me guilty. But now he said, you can disagree with me if you want to, but uh, go in and can take on my instruction under consideration. But that jury didn't find me guilty mm -hmm. because, uh, no, they didn't. So they had to go into a second trial. Now, all of this is in my book, The Echo from David Class. I explain, you know, step by step what happened. But I knew that this trial was for the purpose of discrediting me they wanted a conviction on my record in order that anything that I might say from there forth, especially concerning the Kennedy assassination and some of the things that the Secret Service were doing, they wanted to discredit me and make my testimony of no avail by hanging some criminal record on me. So in the second trial, uh, the judge emptied the courtroom when the jury began to deliberate he put me and my attorney and all the spectators who were not government employees. He locked us out of the court building while the jury was still deliberating and said that 
I was found guilty that during the during the night when we were so the, that jury was not supposed to be deliberating. And so I was found guilty on August the 12th of 1964 and start serving time in the penitentiary on uh, June, uh, June the 26th, 1966. During that time, the one of the key witnesses, uh, Joseph Spagnoli, was on trial himself for counterfeiting uh, United States Savings Bond. And it came up in his trial, he confessed during his trial before the same judge. He says, I committed perjury in the Bolden trial. He said, the government told me what to say. So I, here's the testimony he went in his pocket, pulled out a piece of paper, gave it to the judge and said, this is where they wrote down my testimony, what I'm supposed to say in the Bolden trial. The judge said, you, are you admitting that you committed perjury in the Bolden trial? He says, yes, sir. And his attorney, uh, uh, had indicated to the judge that the judge told him don't bring up the Bolden trial during the Spagnola trial. He didn't want that, that brought out, that fact brought out. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Now when we went to the appeals court, Seventh Circuit's Court of Appeal, the chief judge Hastings brought in this U.S. attorney who was accused of soliciting perjury in my and my child, who was accused of setting up the whole thing, the chief judge said, these are very serious charges. Now go get Richard Sykes, bring him in, and we want to question him about whether or not he did this thing, because if he did, somebody's got to go to jail. So they brought Sykes in during a, during an argument before the uh, Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in October of 1965. And now, when Sites came before the three-judge panel, uh, the, the chief judge asked him, point blank, did you solicit perjury in a Bolden trial? The assistant United Attorney, Richard T. Sites, took the Fifth Amendment. He looked the judge in the eye and said, Your Honor, I refuse to answer on the basis that my answer may tend to incriminate me. And regardless of that, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeal, Court of Appeal affirmed the conviction, and we appealed the affirmation to the United States Supreme Court, and they refused to hear the case. So I began to serve my time in June of 1966, on June the 26th, 1966, after being denied social rare by the United States Supreme Court. Now. If it had ended there, that, that would have been sufficient, but they had something else in store for me. They had to try to put me in a position where from that time forth, that whatever that I might say would be discredited. And the only way that they could do that would be to do something with my mind, to even drive me insane, declare me insane, because they didn't want to kill me. They didn't want to kill me. That would have been too obvious because they know that I had uh, made arrangements for the information to be delivered in case of my death. So, the only thing that they could do would be to do what the government usually do, is to declare you insane. So, during my time in the stay in the uh, United States Justice Department system, they sent me to this place in Springfield, Missouri. Springfield, Missouri, the, the federal prison camp there. They first put me in the camp. So I was spending, it's a four-tier type of institution there. They have a prison camp, which I was assigned to. Now, the prisoners in the prison camp, they take care of the prison grounds, they serve in the kitchen, and they do the job of taking care and maintenance of the institution. They also have a hospital there. Uh, inmates who are serving time who have diabetes, who have heart problems, they go to the hospital there in Springfield. They also have a transitory unit there where people are being transferred long distances across the United States to the other side from coast to coast. That's a drop-off point 
for the United States Marshals because it's almost halfway between the, the West and the East Coast. And, and the fourth thing it is, it's a psychiatric ward that they have the largest psychiatric uh, 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 sales there uh, in the nation. That, that's one of the main ones. That's where they sent the bird man to Alcatraz. So one night on, <clears throat> on July the 6th of 1967, at 3 o'clock in the morning, they removed me from the camp and they marched me over to the psychiatric ward for no reason whatsoever. And then they began to try to force me to take these uh, uh, drugs, mm -hmm. these uh, psychotropic drugs. And one of them was Elavil, 150 grams. I never will uh, forget that. And I complained to the psychologist there and to the guards. I said, I'm not on medication. I'm assigned to the camp. They said, you are now. So they had in store for me to declare me insane and muddy up my name so that once that I was released, their defense of anything that I would say, well, oh, he was declared insane. You can't believe anything this guy said. However, it didn't work out like that. The person who was in charge, the chief classification of parole, uh, Mrs. Julius Nichols, uh, was carrying out the orders from Washington, D.C., being the chief of the classification and parole. Nothing can happen to an inmate in an institution unless it's okay by the chief of the classification and parole. So they could not change the status of me from a camp inmate to a psychiatric inmate without the signature of the chief of the classification and parole. So as fate would have it, and I explained the details, in my book, uh, The Echo from Dealey Plaza, what happened. I had to figure out a way first to defeat the chemicals that they were trying to place into my body to make me obedient uh, 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 to their will and to take my will away from me. So I found out a way to do that. So on August, August the uh, 6th of 1967, they were supposed to take me before a committee and change my status. However, the chief of the classification and parole, the morning before I was to appear before the committee, committed suicide himself. He committed, yes, he committed suicide. And so they could not change my status. And so they put me back in the camp shortly after that transferred me to Montgomery, Alabama. So that's how I happen to be here now. And since that time, I've pursued different avenues of trying to get my freedom uh, restored, to get my good name restored, because all of the facts are out. They couldn't be clear. Now, we have a petition at the present time in front of President Obama. We're asking that the president appoint someone to reinvestigate this case, look through the file, and give me a pardon on the basis that I was innocent of the prime charge. That's what we're asking the president to do. That's my only hope. If the president Obama lets me down, I, I just, I, I guess I'll have to die with this blemish on my record, which would. Uh, at 81 years old, you know, that could, couldn't be too much longer. So I'm sort of running out of time. But I tell you one thing, brother. Uh, I found out everything that as a young man, what my heart wanted to know to help the people. I answered those questions. And I was able over the next 35 or 40 years to reduce those writings, those uh, uh, projects writings. One began with the Echo from Dealey Plaza, and I've written on slideshare.com. A person go to slideshare.com and type in the name Abraham Bolden and look it up. They'll see 10 books 
that I have authored. They're not for sale. They're free reads that answers the problem of the crime in the neighborhood, that answers the problem of why is there crime in the neighborhood, why are we killing one another. And they just go through there and they'll find the answer to all of the problems that we're facing today. So, a few questions, questions I had. I had. Um, um, well, hold on, give me a second. I'm getting a little feedback. Anyway, anyway so the question, so the question I had question. was, do you feel that J. Edgar Hoover's FBI and the Secret Service was in cahoots with allowing that to happen to the president? Yes. Yes. Okay, so so that's since they... That's my opinion now. That, that, that's my own opinion. Okay. But based on facts that I know that have not been made public. Okay, so because the moves they made towards you, obviously they, they wanted to shut you up. I mean, it just from what you you know, we just noticed a pattern of how they do things in this country. Um, so, and you saw the things that the agents were doing. Um, you had agents around you that were literally white supremacists. That's right. You know, literally, which is you know horrible around a president that wanted to try to assist Dr. King. And uh, did you ever get a chance to meet Dr. King? No, I didn't. No, he came to Chicago, but I wasn't able to meet him. Okay, did you ever get a chance to meet uh, maybe Malcolm X or uh, Elijah Muhammad? I met, oh yes, I met the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I met uh, uh, Malcolm X at one time. And as a matter of fact, I met Obama when he was a uh, senator here in Illinois. And uh, I met a lot of people, but none of them helped me, though. Jesse Jackson. Uh, because this was... Uh, it was an odd case. People were afraid of the government. Mm -hmm. They were actually afraid to help me because in helping me, they know that they would have to be somewhat on the opposite side of what the government wanted everybody else to believe. And so they, rather than risk their uh, little cushion jobs that they had, they would rather stay out of them. Wow. I mean, you know, just the things that you're saying, revisiting history, you know, you, you know, I'm just just basically just soaking it up and, and learning, you know, a lot because um, this is a lot of things that we, you know, have been told and and a lot of people, you know, you have the Kennedy conspiracy. A lot of people keep talking about that, uh, and then you just shedding more light on that based on your time inside the Secret Service of seeing how lax they were and how they were being drunk and chasing women. And it wasn't too long ago the Secret Service got in trouble. I don't know, a year or two ago, I think in Brazil. Uh, somewhere? Catalonia. Catalonia. Yes. Brazil, they got in trouble in Australia, they got in trouble in Hyannisport, Nantucket Sound. See, for 25, 30 years, they had called, been calling me a lie and mm -hmm. saying that what I was saying about the Secret Service and their conduct around the president was, was fictitious, that I was playing the race card because I was a convict and this and that. This is how they fought me. They said, this guy is lying. Now, within the past 10 to 12 years, everything is coming out. The one thing that the, that the media refused to do is to go all the way back to my case, which was the first evidence of misconduct of the Secret Service. They only go back so far. Now, to... Uh, and that is not to give me the credit for first revealing these activities among the agents of the United States Secret Service. They want to cut me out of the picture altogether because then the laxity of the Secret Service would be fully revealed over an extensive amount of time, much longer than 10 years. Now, do you think the, the Secret Service right now with President Obama, you know, we've heard some issues with them during his tenure, you know, as president. Um, do you see them as doing good protecting him? I mean, because I know he's uh, under a lot of threats, a little bit more than probably any other president. Uh, but I mean, what do you, what's your opinion on, on the Secret Service now that you see? Well, he, he has uh, several African-American agents around him now, so I feel a little bit better. But some of the things that have, that have happened, like the uh, person jumping the fence, ramming a car into the uh, White House gate, 
seven bullets fired in, in the upper floor of the White House and no one uh, know what happened or who fired the shots. These type of things still tell me that there is a, a lax attitude uh, prevailed uh, around the President of the United States. Now, in one city, uh, a person got on the elevator with the President. There were two agents on the elevator with the President. A third person got on the elevator with a weapon. And the Secret Service agents didn't know who he was, and Obama didn't know who he was, and nobody knew that this happened until the man said, I got on the elevator with a gun on uh, with the president and two Secret Service agents. Now, how could something like that happen? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Those well, Secret Service agents should have been fired immediately if we even let right, that happen. Right, right away. Right away. But uh, the the I think that I just hope he makes it out alive. I'm hoping that President Obama makes it out alive because he's not out in the woods yet. Yeah, that's that's really sad. You know that that we, you know, just to know that's going on, and and, and like I say, you have a window into it, and nothing has changed. Um, you know, based off the, the reports we're getting, um, you know, that's not good. That's really not good. You know, especially for the, you know, Michelle and the kids, and you know, things like that. There's a lot of people in this nation, you know to this day do not like him and his family inside that White House. They can't stand it. Yes, he has endured more disrespect than any president of the United States of America for no reason at all. Now, Nixon accused some disrespect, but rightfully so. So did uh, Clinton. These people were, were unfit to be the president of the United States. But Obama has really brought this country forward. They don't give him any credit. They they uh, compare his wife to a gorilla, and they they just it's just so much disrespect. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and it's not the, it's the presidents of the United States. Um, what is the name of your book? That way we can uh, get people to try to go get your book. That way we can read the full story. Can you give us the full name again? Yes, it's the Echo from D. Lee Plaza, D. E. A. L. E. Y. Plaza, P. L. A. Z. A. Now, D. Lee Plaza is the place where President Kennedy was assassinated. That's the spot where we, D. Lee Plaza. So that's one way to remember the name of the book. And they can get it through Amazon. Now, I do send out autographed copies. There's softback copies. A person can write me at a.bolden at sbcglobal.net. Autographed copies, $20 plus $5 mailing fee. And I'll autograph the book and send it to them. All right, so make sure you know you read the book because it is definitely something that none of us really knew anything about. Especially me, I didn't know anything about uh, this, and you know how to, some people could act in the Secret Service, and it's something that you should really take seriously. You know, especially protecting the president or presidential candidates. Um, you know, here, and if some of you are interested in uh, emailing uh, Abraham and asking him some questions, um, do that, and, and maybe he can expound on uh, some things with you uh, a little bit more. But get the book, get the book, so you can find out more in detail of what really happened to him, because. Uh, he was just set up, you know, from what I'm hearing. He was set up because he had the right information about a cover up, and that how many times that has happened to people um, in this country all over the place. You know, some people end up, you know, unfortunately get killed when they have information. So he, he's one of the lucky ones that didn't get killed. Look at what happened in the snow. They drove him out of the country. He had to leave the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Snowden, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, he. I couldn't leave the country. I could barely get out of the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and also the the free books that you have is it is it on uh, your website? The one detailing the water crime is happening in the black community. It's on uh, slideshare dot com dot net, slideshare dot net, and then just type in my name, Abraham Bold. Okay, slideshare. because. It, because I want to, I actually want to look at those books myself and, and see what the, what you wrote down because um, you know it'd be interesting to read. So I'm I'm definitely gonna log it down for myself. Be surprised. Read uh, 
to uh, read through it and you'll see the dilemma of the black man. It explains how we got here, the psychological reason that we're killing each other and everything. The dilemma of the black man. Okay, and also, you know, make sure you go read that as well, um, because we need to know the psychology of this, and also, you know, him serving as a police officer and Secret Service agent, and that's what he was really trying to figure out. Why do we keep having a crime in our community? Why are we having, you know, murdering each other? Why is it allowed to keep happening? Sure. Um, you know, so we definitely make sure you read those books. Yeah. So, Abraham, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we definitely appreciate you, you know, bringing knowledge and definitely some history that we did not know um, at all. And even about you as the first black Secret Service agent. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me, sir. I've enjoyed myself and I hope that I've enlightened you. You're listening. All right. Thank you.